Hey guys, it's me, Kim. How are you doing? I'm great, thank you so much for asking. This video is going to be about the Hulu series, Shrill. I only really decided to watch this show because Samantha Irby writes for it. Samantha Irby is one of my favorite writers. She is a brilliant black woman humorist. I just think that she is beyond brilliant. And then I did a little bit of research and saw that this show is based on a book by Lindy West. And I listened to interviews with Lindy and she's such an interesting person. And she gave up social media because people were, were harassing her and trolling her so badly. So I was excited to watch this show because I knew it was gonna be something different. And I'm so glad I did. I loved it. I loved this freaking show. I thought it was really, really good and well done. And it did give us something different and something that we really need. So this is gonna be a deep dive. Obviously there's going to be hella spoilers in this video. If you don't want to be spoiled, it's time for you to go. Shrill the Book is a memoir by Lindy West, but this, TV show is like a, uh, an interpretation of the memoir and the star of the show is A.D. Bryant. She is on Saturday Night Live if you are into that sort of thing. I really liked her in this show a lot. You know, I don't really be watching Saturday Night Live. I don't know who does, but I liked her in this show. In this show, A.D. plays Annie who is the protagonist and Annie is fat. And that fatness is a huge part of her life. It is the center of the storyline. What I liked about this storyline and how it handles Annie and her fatness is she's not fake confident, you know? It's not like, I'm gonna conquer the world and who cares what you think about me? But it's also, she's not a tragic figure. It is a nice balance. We get to see the ups and downs of her life in ways that feel very natural and honest. I knew I was gonna like this show from one of the earliest scenes where we see Annie in front of a mirror in her house and she's trying on clothes and she squats down and puts her shirt over her knees to stretch it out. And I was like, oh, that feels so familiar. So I don't have a big body, but I have a big butt. And so many times I have in front of a mirror, pulled something to stretch it out. I'm trying not to mess up this microphone. Pull something to stretch it out and you know, try to make some more room in the butt, in the stomach, like that's real. And I love those kinds of moments in this show because it, it highlights that I think every single person in this writer's room is a woman. Obviously there are women in this writer's room and they are being very honest about <laughs> what it's like to live in a female body. I like that so much of this show is just normal. It's not aspirational, it's not look at the cool town, look at the cool job, look at the cool house or clothes. It's like a normal house, normal clothes, normal job. I appreciate that because everything doesn't need to be glossy and aspirational. Let's just see some regular people with regular bodies doing regular stuff. And nothing is going particularly well for Annie. She has a regular job at a regular low level newspaper that nobody would probably wanna work at. Her family is kind of fractured in that way that most of our families are dysfunctional. She has a terrible relationship with the dude who is horrible and we'll get into that later. The only thing that is really functional in, in Annie's life is her relationship with her friends and like, that's relatable. She just seems to be like a normal woman in her late 20s, late 20s, maybe early 30s, but like late 20s, who's just trying to figure it out, okay? We're all just trying to figure this out. I love anything that helps me see outside of my experience. I don't know what it's like to navigate the world in a fat body. Annie's at a coffee shop. She sees a flyer for a personal trainer, toned Tanya. She whips out her phone and then this happens. Here, take a tab. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Oh, wow, your wrists are tiny. Oh, you actually have a really small frame. There is a small person inside of you dying to get out. Oh, well, I hope that small person's okay in there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it gets even possible, but you can do this. You weren't meant to carry around all this extra weight. Oh, wow, um, very cool. <laughs> I know I can help you. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. No, thank yourself for the amazing way you're gonna feel after you give yourself permission to be well. Thank you, me. <laughs> you could be so pretty. 
have no idea what it's like to be accosted like that because of my weight. Now, I have a, a certain type of body shape that attracts attention and comments, but that is a, a different thing. I think I heard Lindy West say on NPR that that scene is based on something that actually happened to A.D. Bryant, and that is completely unconscionable. And not to relate everything back to being black, but it does remind me how for black people and for fat people, when your body is marked as non-normative outside of the ideal, it is viewed as public space. So people feel entitled to say things to you, to touch you, to comment, to make you feel uncomfortable so that they can assert their power. As a black woman who has a big butt, people say things about my butts, people sometimes touch my butt. As a black woman, people comment on my hair, people sometimes touch my hair. Hair. And in that scene, there was even an all fat people look alike thing when the, the two people standing by say, oh, she looks like Rosie O'Donnell. And I'm like, oh, like, oh, all of this shit is the same. Like, we are all dealing with some similar stuff. But the thing is, I don't have to think about fat phobia. And fat phobia is still accepted in our society in ways that racism and even misogynoir noir are not acceptable. Racism is out here, it still exists. All sorts of isms are still out here, they still exist. But it is quite interesting the way that people are not admonished for being openly hostile or gross to fat folks in public. Annie herself deals with fat phobia in all aspects of her life. We see it pop up over and over again and it is particularly gross the way that her boss says gross fat shaming things in the workplace, but he thinks he's this progressive white liberal. And that comes to a head in a really interesting and pointed way at the end of the series. Maybe they need to hear that. Well, maybe someone needs to stop being a bully. And the millennial pulls out the bully card. Everyone got their cards, not you, Andy. Jesus Christ, you're a gay man. How can you not be sympathetic towards this? I was born gay. I had no choice, you do. Wow, that is fucked, Gabe. I used to idolize you, but you're just a close-minded coward. We see the intersection of fat phobia and medicine, fat phobia and contraception introduced in a really interesting way with Annie's experience with the morning after pill. So she takes it because this no good man, she likes to raw dog, <laughs> have sex without condoms. So she takes it, but she gets pregnant because the morning after pill doesn't work for people over 175 pounds. Now look, I feel like I've heard that somewhere, but honestly, that should be on a billboard. I mean, it should be in every magazine, it should be on a billboard, but also it should be unconscionable to make a product that is broadly marketed to women and not have it work on such a, a large demographic of women in this country. Like. Like if there was something that just didn't work on Asian people or just didn't work on black people or whatever, well, there there is stuff that is like that, but that's wrong. I love the way that the show dealt with Annie's abortion. It wasn't a huge drama. There wasn't no boo-hooing and sobbing and my life is ruined. She did what she had to do. Her roommate slash best friend was there and supportive. She did it and moved on with her life. I appreciate an abortion story that doesn't focus on my life is over and you know, I'm wrapped with guilt and you know, because abortion is very common. You, it's very common and everybody who gets an abortion isn't laying in the street crying afterwards. It's a medical procedure. I loved this show's handling of body positivity because it wasn't trite, it wasn't what we've seen all the time before. And it's interesting to me that the core message of body positivity and empowerment comes from the strippers. Okay, these are new ideas for me, but they make sense. You know, could I, could I also ask you, like, does it ever feel weird to be in your underwear and then have men come in here and like tell you what to do? Uh, men do not tell me what to do. I've got a fat ass and big titties. I tell them what to do. I never thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know some people are gonna say, you know, she's just a stripper, but I'm good at it. And I make money and I make my own rules, so. Yeah, that, that's so great. I, I love that. I could never pull that off. Yes, you could, bitch. You've got a fat ass and big titties. You should be telling men what to do.
I love the freaking strippers. Again, they had normal bodies. They were empowered. They were self-possessed. They were making it very clear to Annie who like came in with these ideas about aren't you exploited and don't you feel whatever. And they were like, no girl, we're not exploited. I do what I like to do. I make money. You're exploited. <laughs> you know, you're exploited. I definitely disagree with this idea that we're all sex workers if we have sex with men. No, sex work is a profession that requires a certain skill set. We are not all sex workers. But if you are a woman who does have romantic or sexual relationships with men, you are subject often to certain kinds of coercion and the way that, that patriarchy invades those relationships. And I love that it was the strippers who were like, no girl, you, you gotta do something, you take control. And that stripper message to Annie is really important because she's in this horrible relationship with this horrible dude named Ryan. He is just the bottom of the barrel, the mistake in your 20s that gave you all of the best stories but you would never, never go back to. That's, that's Ryan. One thing about this show that I will say, I don't know if I've ever seen sex scenes like that with fat women. I feel like Normally, when there's a sex scene with a fat woman, I don't know if I've seen it on TV. I don't know if I've seen it in movies. Maybe it's there. Maybe I missed it. But I feel like usually it's like played up for jokes or laughs or there's a, an out. But these sex scenes are like sex scenes. And I was into it. I was. I was like, oh, I've never seen this before. But anyways, Ryan is horrible. I was so freaking triggered. Ryan only has one pillow, no job to speak of, lives with these people, his brother and a friend, makes Annie sneak out of the house, go out the back door. I mean, it was just, it was so triggering. <laughs> and it's so interesting because I tweeted about this. It's so interesting that so many women who have sex with men have similar stories about being mistreated in the same way or being blown off in the same way. It's like, why is this so rampant. So a big central part of this show is Annie's relationship with Ryan and as frustrating as I found it because he is really horrible and he improves only marginally throughout this show, I did find it to be very real that she didn't kick him to the curb and find a Prince Charming because that's not real life. Like real life is you are sleeping with this man, he sucks, he doesn't have anything going for him, you're trying to get your life together and you just keep sleeping with him and trying to make a relationship with him because as Annie literally says, something is better than nothing. Like that is real, it's, it's so freaking real. There have been moments in my life where I like didn't think that I would ever get to have that, you know? because of what I looked like or because there's like a certain way that your body is supposed to be and I'm not that. And that maybe if I was just sweet enough and nice enough and easygoing enough with any guy, that that would be enough for someone. Honey, you're being so mean to yourself. I mean, it makes me so sad. Well. I mean, as a viewer, when Annie, through all of these six episodes, is going back and forth with Ryan, you're like, girl, go, no, stop. You doesn't have anything. He's horrible. Does he have a job? What does he do for a living? At the same time, you're like, no, she's going to stay with him because this is real life. You know, we've we've all been inextricably linked to a fuck boy at some point. When Ryan said, we never said this was exclusive, I was like, oh my God. Like every, every fuck boy says the same lines. It's like they get a fuck boy manual and they fucking thumb through that shit and they regurgitate the same lines to all of us. I did feel like it was very real and honest, but one thing this show does is the only people in this show who are not in interracial relationships are the white people. Now, I noticed that because I'm black and I notice when a black person is with a white person or a white person is with an Asian person or whatever, but it is pretty interesting that the white people are the only people in this world who date people of their same race. 
It's just interesting. I already said I loved A.D. Bryant in this role. I thought she brought the right amount of wit and sarcasm. And she comes off as bratty, you know, bratty in that uh, Lena Dunham, Hannah Horvath way, but more likable. But the star of this series for me was her friend Fran, who's played by Lolly Adafope. Fran is written gorgeously. She gets all of these one-liners that are hysterically funny. How can I take away his favorite thing? My favorite thing is you not having a child with a guy who says raw dog. You're trying to take away my favorite thing. Apology accepted for pepper spraying me in the face. I don't apologize to white people. She's a queer fuck boy, but Lolly's delivery, it is a perfect match of great writing and great acting because there is uh, an interpretation of the Fran character that we hate, but the way that it's played, ugh. I look forward anytime that she's on screen. I, I knew a laugh was coming or I knew some heart was coming. I just love her. I love her. And also, I don't know if I've ever seen a fat, queer woman. I've just, I've never seen that character. I like to see new stuff. I've never seen that. And Fran is a good compliment to Annie because Annie is racked with insecurity and her romantic life is shitty and she running after Ryan and all of that. And Fran is fat too, but she is not racked with those same insecurities. She's pretty sure of herself. She is a fuck boy, but like she's sexual and, and it's just, I like that we get multiple fat characters and we get multiple multi-dimensionality and the different fat characters. I saw people say that they didn't love the portrayal of Annie's relationship with her mom because Annie came off as so self-involved and bratty and entitled and she did, but you know, that's how it be sometimes. <laughs> like, it be like that sometimes. Um, but I do think that there is something about the way that the resentment that Annie has toward her mom and her family is portrayed that is very interesting and honest. So often our parents come in and they're trying to fix things and they're trying to help, but like they created the things that they're trying to fix, you know, like, and then with their help, they're actually only making it worse. <laughs> like that was so relatable in the way that Annie's mom approached her weight loss and whatever. And it's like, girl, you need to take a step back. You're, you're hurting. You're not helping. You're hurting. Despite the fact that her mom obviously made some bad choices. Uh, we all do, right? We all make mistakes. Our parents are people. But her mom is not painted one dimensionally. I really liked in this show that we get to see some of the mom's deep thoughts and we get to see her struggling and wrestling with things and she's not just completely painted as the villain and Annie is the victim and we see how okay so so often the dynamic plays out that the mom is strict disciplinarian and runs the tight ship and whatever and the dad is like so cool and everybody chill out and the daughter loves the dad and like resents the mom and that's like a real dynamic but I liked that this show underscores that somebody has to be the, dis somebody has to make sure the trains run on time. Somebody has to make sure everybody eats, everybody gets to the doctor, all of our needs are taken care of, and so often that burden falls on the shoulders of moms, but yet we end up presenting moms because they're the ones who are doing the, dis the disciplining. And I loved the scene where that stuff comes to a head and her dad is like, look. You're suffocating both of us. Hey, and Annie, that's enough. Dad, I'm just defending both of us. You know how hard your mom works? She busts her ass all the time for everyone. Uh, and you are acting like a little brat, I just thinking about yourself. Your mom thinks about everybody. Can't you see that? Dad, I'm sorry, but you have to admit she's on my back constantly and I never- yeah, fuck! Just knock it off. You're resentful, we get it. You have your trauma. Your mom's got her own stuff to deal with and she's got our stuff to deal with. Give it a rest. I like that. I just, I like that nobody gets the short end of the stick in this show. And that is so hard because there's only six episodes and they're only like 30 minutes each. 
but they did such a good job balancing. I love that there are multiple black people on this show, multiple people of color. We didn't just get Fran, we got her brother, we got Amadi in the office, we got Ruthie, looks a little Asian. I don't know what she is, but I don't think she's all the way white. There's no tokenism. This show really marks kind of a, a, a very slow but steady progression of things kind of shifting, evolving in Annie's life. I mean, you know, things in her relationship shift, things in her work life shift. I mean, it's very, the pace of the progression feels very natural. I'll say one thing that for me, you know, just kind of, Tick something off was she gets mad at her boss and quits and it's like, that's privilege because she apparently doesn't have anything to fall back on. She doesn't really have anything. I like what my initial thought was, but how are you gonna pay your bills? Like what's gonna happen? <laughs> you know, like most people cannot quit because they hate their boss. The one part of the storyline where I was like, oh, I don't know was Annie is dealing with this troll throughout the entire show. She finally gets to be a published writer, and because she's fat, these people um, are trolling her and putting pictures of pigs up in the comments and all of that stuff. The internet is a hellhole, basically. I mean, we already knew that. She finds her troll, she goes to his house. The dialogue at his house was just a bit on the nose. I don't love when stuff is right on the nose, when two minutes after she shows up at his, at his house, he's pouring his, his heart out to her and he has trauma. And then all of a sudden it turns to, do you wanna come in? It's like, okay, well, that's just a little too, a little too on the nose. But for the sake of the storyline, I understood why it was there. That mirrors Lindy West's own story. She was trolled horribly. People talked about her sick father who has now passed away. And she was trolled so badly that she completely quit social media. Like she does not have Twitter. There is a pool party scene in this movie that is just love. My favorite thing, I've said this in other videos, I just like to see people feeling good and hanging out. And that pool party scene is not something that I've ever seen before. I don't know how many times I've said that in this freaking review. It was just a lot of fat ladies hanging out, chilling, having fun, being carefree, being confident. I like that Annie comes into the pool party juxtaposed to Fran, who was just cool in this yellow and just completely chill. And Annie is in her jeans and her top. And, and over the course of that pool party, she slowly, something clicks for her and she gets to reconcile that childhood trauma that we all have around, you know, a certain issue or an event, an item. She has childhood trauma around pools and swimming and all of that. And she, gets to deal with that a little bit at that pool party. I like that we see her open up and have fun, but she doesn't come out of the pool party being like, I have no more insecurities, everything is good, right? There's um, a slow and steady progression of opening up, being more confident, being more assertive, even in her sex life with Ryan, right? That first sex scene, she's like, don't take off my bra. And then later on, she's like, yeah, take off my bra. Let's let it all hang out. I basically am a sucker for a storyline where a woman confronts her childhood trauma. Sign me up for that. Let's all heal ourselves. I say that this show made me confront my fat phobia because I have extreme body dysmorphia. I have issues with food. When I was writing out this script, I was getting uncomfortable because I was having to write out the word fat all the time. Fat, fat, fat. It comes up all the time because that is such a central part of the story. And I was feeling weird about it. Like, should, well, should I say that word? Should I use another word? And then I recognized that Lindy West used the word fat and A.D. Bryant used the word fat. And they don't see anything wrong with it. I was projecting my own negative feelings about the word because I have extreme body dysmorphia and I like borderline have an eating disorder and have all of these issues with food. And I, in my mind, view it so negatively in ways that they don't. And so I have to get rid of that stuff or, or let go of it in order to really appreciate this show. And I really feel like I'm so grateful that this show talked about fatness in the frank way that it did, offered a different insight, offered different 
bad experiences so that those of us who do not have that experience because we've all been socialized into fat phobia that we can really get comfortable with it and like figure out like what is that feeling like wh like what is this dredging up and hopefully be able to stomp it out and i look i'm trying to stomp out all of my prejudices you know i'm trying to own up to that shit and stomp it out so i cannot be a shitty person in this world and i think that shrill helps me to be less shitty and i appreciate that like genuinely i cannot let my fat phobia or my fat shaming or whatever get in the way of enjoying a really really good show now do i think that this was a perfect show nope and i also think that the first episode is the best episode it's really really good but this is a good show and i would recommend it to people well that's all i have to say about that thank you guys so much for watching go watch shrill i recommend it thought it was really quite good i love of Lolly Adafope. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. I really, really like her a lot. Hysterical. A.D. Bryant, very, very good. The writing, very good. Just a, a well constructed, just fun show. It, it's only six episodes. It takes you less than three hours to get through. So go over there, watch that, support it. I'm for it. Everybody says you don't like anything. Yes, I do. I like this. So over on Patreon, the companion video it's I made so is me talking about my so body dysmorphia. People have asked me about our, it, what it means, how I think I developed it, how I'm managing body, it. So I went through all body, of that stuff over there. Eat, Obviously, it's patrons how only. Thank you guys so much it. for your support. On, this channel and watchers. the Patreon has grown immensely in the past month. Like, it's crazy. I genuinely appreciate you. Send me an email, leave a comment, find a way to message me privately. I, I don't broadcast that stuff, but you can do it. I believe in you. Buy some merch, sign up for the email newsletter. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next time.